Two years ago, a girl who attends my wife's in-home daycare started experiencing stomach aches. She stopped sleeping well and didn't want to go to school. A bully, right? Sort of. Eventually, her parents got her to confide in them. She believed, she believed that the so-called Islamic State was going to come and kill her. She was eight. Last summer, I'm at a playground with my kids. This 10-year-old runs over with a couple of seven-year-olds in tow, and he does what older kids often do with younger ones. He teaches them. He tells them, and I quote, Donald Trump is going to nuke Mexico because all of the people there are bad. They ran off moments later, and I so badly wanted to chase this kid down. I wanted to grab him by the shoulders, maybe shake him a little bit, teach him. Getting arrested in front of my kids that day seemed like a bad idea, <laughs> so I didn't. And then, of course, months later, the election itself. Now, events like these, they get you thinking. Now, for years, I've thought that the World Issues class I teach should be mandatory for graduation. Now, I believe that current events and issues should flow through all of our subjects at all grade levels. Benefit number one for doing so, fighting fear. The number one argument against bringing current events into the curriculum is an understandable one. It's the one that says we need to protect our kids from stories like these. But are we really protecting them if we're not providing them factual, reassuring, age-appropriate translations of current events? Or are we merely allowing social media and ill-informed friends and background news to fill that void? And if so, what is the cost? We know that anxiety rates are skyrocketing. Is there causality in this correlation? In 2016, NSPCC's Childline Service had approximately 12,000 counseling sessions with kids who were struggling with anxiety, and they noted a sharp uptick in the number of kids saying that world events were fueling some of their anxiety. We know that positivity and optimism create positive health benefits. Would not the reverse be true? Isn't it true that we fear what we do not understand? You know, we are bombarded by bad news every day. It sells. But it also hijacks our amygdalas, makes us think and act in irrational ways, and our kids are not immune to this. They are getting it outside of school, out of context, and without guidance. Before I move to number two, I need to bring you guys in. I'm a teacher. I can't talk for 11-ish minutes without doing something interactive. So you know the world, you know its challenges, and you all have hands, so get them ready. Back in 1990, approximately 40% of the world was struggling through a state of extreme poverty. That's something that doesn't exist in North America. Using your fingers, I want you to guess how far that rate has fallen if at all. One finger will be a 5% drop, so eight fingers will mean that extreme poverty has been banished from the earth. Okay? And if you think it stayed the same or gone up, just keep your hands down. All right, guesses in. Let's see them. Hands up if you think extreme poverty's been dropping. Hands. A couple hands, a couple hands up. Anyway, you got some hands up. Anybody got two hands up? No? All right. Okay, all right. Thank you. We'll move on. I'll come back to that. Benefit number two of incorporating current events across the curriculum. Hope. I have a confession to make. When I first started teaching world issues, I brought the darkness. But I forgot, in the words of Bruce Coburn, to kick at it until it bled light. Sometimes I felt like a director of that scene from A Clockwork Orange, you know, the one with the eyes held open, you will bear witness to this crumbling world. That all changed the first time I watched a TED Talk by Hans Rosling. A mentor to millions, including Bill and Melinda Gates, he believed that we should pay closer attention to the global trend lines than the fear-fueled daily news. And to my surprise, and most of you, the world is improving on almost every non-environmental metric. Take extreme poverty. In 2016, according to the World Bank, we dropped below 10 percent. 
Now, that's an economic stat. It may not motivate everyone, so let's try another one. Since 1990, the rate of children dying before the age of five has been cut in half. Half. And if you ever hear somebody tell you that that just leads to overpopulation in the world, the reverse is actually true. 13,000 kids would have died today. They didn't. Ask yourself, why doesn't everybody know this? Why isn't this headline news? Isn't this the greatest story of our era? Tell it. Tell it to kids and watch what happens. You will get smiles. You will get a mood boost that lasts. I have seen it. Our kids care about the world. But like the adults, they think it's crumbling. It isn't. They need to be reassured of this. They need hope. We all do. So if you didn't raise your hands, don't feel bad. According to this year's Gates letter, 88% of people, so about the percentage of this room that didn't raise their hands, said the same thing. And if you did raise a hand or, or two, go ahead and pat yourselves on the back. But for all of you, keep those hands up. Challenge someone the next time they tell you that the world is falling apart. Keep that hope alive. This was the, the mission of my mentor, Hans Rosling. We lost him this year. It falls to us now to keep his dream of a more fact-based worldview alive. Numbers three and four, empathy and cultural literacy. According to a University of Michigan analysis of 72 studies spanning 30 years, teen empathy rates have dropped 40% in three decades. Narcissism rates are up 58%. Now, there are many reasons for this, but one of them is a decline in perspective taking, something that happens naturally when we engage with the champions and challenges of the real world. For the last seven years, my volunteer work has involved connecting teachers from all over North America and thousands of their students with peers on the other side of the globe via Skype. There were a lot of benefits, but the largest one was empathy enhancement. Current events doesn't just need to be about reading or watching now. It can and should involve connecting. Number five, sharing a common reality. English and history classes, at their best, are popular with kids because they tap into that same power that drives us to the movie theaters and that brought our ancestors to the campfires. The power of a story. This is who we are. This is where we've been. This is where we are going. Current events tell these stories, and they can be better than any movies. In fact, in some cases, the heroes save more lives than the ones who wear capes. This is why study after study shows that kids who read newspapers become adults who read newspapers. The teachers dream of producing a lifelong learner can, through current events, be realized. Number six, critical thinking. Now, a lot has been written in the last few months about the importance of critical thinking for adults and students to handle that onslaught of information, ideas, and opinions. I want you to, for a moment, if you can, picture all of the best stuff that you have seen written. And imagine that I have said it in a slightly different way to save time. And it is now completely obvious to all of you how critical thinking skills connect directly to learning about current events in the classroom. This one, I think, does not require further explanation. <laughs> Moving on. Number seven, citizenship. We tell our students what citizenship means, but do we actively showcase the passionate ones who research and organize and volunteer and speak out and vote? What about the ones who lead? Are politicians cast as villains in the minds of our students? Because if they are, leadership positions will not appeal to our kids. Even voting will appear fruitless. We know this to be true because we see the voting rates. And all of these citizens, they are our neighbors. They are our national figures. They are our global icons. And they are the people our kids will meet when they engage with current events and issues. Those people will inspire our kids to take action. 
even if our kids are critiquing them in the process, they will become active citizens themselves. Number eight, conversations. We teachers, we love answering questions, but I think we're at our best when we are eliciting questions or sparking debates. Glorious, insightful, respectful, face-to-face -face debates in an era when all caps and exclamation marks and unfriend buttons have become discussion norms. Conversation is a skill. It is one that we can develop. It is one that will grow and thrive in the classroom, but also around the dinner table, where we can have excellent family conversations and co-construct family values, because the kids heard about it in school and they want to talk about it at night. I can't wait for the moment when one of my three daughters says, what's your source for that, Dad? <laughs> Number nine, test scores. Numbers. They flow through current events. They can be tied easily to all elements of the math curriculum. Shouldn't global demographics and global statistics have a seat at the math table? Why would we divorce the chemistry of vaccines or the biology of crops from the modern realities of malaria or drought? And when fewer than 40% of U.S. students are taught that climate change is linked to fossil fuels, are we really meeting science outcomes? Bring the current events and issues into all subjects, you will see the engagement rates go up, but you will also see the test scores rise. And in 2018, PISA will evaluate the OECD countries on global competence for the first time. How are our kids going to do on that? Finally, PBL. Teachers know this to mean problem-based learning or project-based learning, both great things. I would like to highlight another one today, purpose-based learning. When our students critically engage with current events and issues and collectively craft solutions, purpose will follow. And if you cannot find that in the curriculum, I guarantee you we will find it in the school's mission and vision statements. What are our kids going to become? What do we want them to become? Well, it's a big world. And teachers are asked to do far too much already. So let me suggest two quick things to do to get started, whether you are a teacher or a citizen or a parent. First, find a current events resource that is written specifically for youth. One that has bold words and background sidebars and open-ended complex questions. I work for one such resource and I'm proud to. Canadian organization that produces what in the world. This summer we are launching in the US with the Global Times. There are lots of other resources. Find one. Number two, Tap into the power of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. This universal charter for a better world, this rainbow of cross-curricular connections, follow it. And at the end of it, you will find solid gold resources and inspiring videos with celebrities and wonderful connections for kids. It is a great entry point. This is why a few teachers and I founded this year Teach SDGs. We are a collection of teachers trying to get more and more teachers to bring the global goals into their classrooms. We are working directly with the United Nations and have partnered specifically with world's largest lesson to accomplish this. Join us. Pledge to teach SDGs. Teachers have the power to craft an entire future. It is an enormous power. They and their students are meant for so much more than test scores. They and you are meant to serve this world, and our kids can come with us, but we have to teach them about the world first. The real world. That one with some motivating trend lines that offer hope. So keep those fingers up, but also put some steel around those toes, and let us kick at the darkness where people who should never be invisible are struggling without voices. Let us kick and kick and kick at that darkness until it bleeds light. Let us empower our kids to learn about, care about, and act on behalf of this only world of ours. Thank you.